uh, honorable elders, student and faculty colleagues, uh, guests of the college, welcome to the University of Saskatchewan College of Law. My name is Mark Carter. I'm uh, chair of the Speakers Committee. Uh, our real pleasure to have with us today uh, Judge David Arnott, Treaty Commissioner. Uh, just a couple of words about our guest. Uh, Judge Arnott is a graduate of this school, graduating in 1975 with his law degree, uh, articling in North Battleford, called to the bar in 76. Uh, between 76 and 78, practicing as a Crown Prosecutor, and in 78, appointed Senior Crown Prosecutor for the Battleford Judicial Centre. Judge Arnott uh, was appointed to the Provincial Court in 1981, sitting in North Battleford and in 1994 accepted a secondment with the Department of Justice um, for Canada as Director General of the Aboriginal Justice Directorate. Uh, 96 promoted to the position of Special Advisor to the Deputy Minister of Justice. Uh, and on January 1st, 1997, Judge Arnott uh, was appointed by the federal government to be Treaty Commissioner for the province of Saskatchewan. Just a word about the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. Uh, in 1989, the FSIN and the Government of Canada created the Office of the Treaty Commissioner to provide recommendations in areas of uh, treaty land entitlement and education. The OTC played a vital role in laying the foundation for the treaty land entitlement agreements between 28 First Nations and the governments of uh, Canada and Saskatchewan. The office continued its work until its mandate expired in 96. And with the uh, conclusion of that original mandate, the FSIN, uh, Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, and the Government of Canada renewed the office of the Treaty Commissioner uh, with uh, Justice uh, Arnott as its uh, Commissioner. Uh, the mandate has focused uh, since then on the nature of the treaty relationship as well as the uh, following uh, uh, specific treaty issues, including the mandate to explore the requirements and implications of uh, treaty implementation. implementation. So we're delighted to have Judge Arnott with us this afternoon speaking to those issues at the end of his mandate as a Treaty Commissioner. Justice Arnott. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that introduction. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say to the Soto uh, elders that are here, Aninjagua, uh, to the, the Cree people, I say, Tanse Mia Kisakao. I thank uh, everyone for being here today and I thank the Creator for allowing me to be here and speak to you today. I'm very honoured to speak uh, this afternoon because this is actually uh, the tenth year uh, of my uh, role as Treaty Commissioner. The very first public speech I gave was right here in this room in 1997 at the Poundmaker Lecture organised by Sock H. Henderson about the honour of the Crown and I'm happy that uh, Dean Brent uh, Cotter has allowed me to come here and in effect uh, close off my uh, career as Treaty Commissioner in this uh, public speech. I want to acknowledge the elders that are here, the Cree elders, the Soto elders, uh, the Dakota elder that's with us here at the back. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that presence. I appreciate the attendance of everyone here today uh, for uh, this presentation. I do want to, as I always do, try to acknowledge the chiefs of my own band, and uh, there's two that are here, Chief Judge uh, Senyuk and former Chief Judge Brosey Nutting. It's nice to see you here today. Thanks for coming. Well, over the course of the next few minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of treaty making in Saskatchewan, and I'm going to talk about these issues and answer these questions. What are treaties? Why were the treaties made? Why did Canada enter into the treaty, and why did the First Nations enter into treaty? I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the treaties, but most importantly, the future of the treaties here in Saskatchewan. I'll talk a little bit about the final report, Treaty Implementation, Fulfilling the Covenant, a report that's going to be available to all the people that are here at the back of the room uh, at the end of this presentation. I'm going to give you some of my ideas and about the thoughts and challenges in the future direction uh, that we'll be taking in Saskatchewan vis-a-vis -vis the treaties. Well, you know, folks, over the course of my term as Treaty Commissioner in Saskatchewan, as you can well imagine, I've been called upon to deal with very many multifaceted and complex issues, very detailed issues. But when I speak to people, there's always a common question they always ask. It's a very, very simple question. It distills to this. Is there hope? 
is there hope for the First Nations to enter into a better partnership, a better relationship with the rest of Canada? Is there hope for the First Nations to have a greater self-sufficiency for their communities? They want to know if there's hope. Hope for the First Nations to share in the prosperity, the peace, and the harmony that's the very essence of Canada. And as Treaty Commissioner here today, I'm here to tell you there is hope. And that hope lies in what's happening at the treaty table in Saskatchewan between the heirs of the treaty parties, Canada, and the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, who've come together to talk about the social, political, and economic relationship that was created by the five treaties here in Saskatchewan. The Office of the Treaty Commission was uh, created by Canada and FSIN to not act as a neutral, independent body to fill two roles. The first role is to advance the treaty process at the treaty table in the political side of our work, and the second role is to work towards a greater harmony for all people in Saskatchewan through a public education program about the treaties. Now on the treaty front, our role was to facilitate discussions at the exploratory treaty table between Canada and the Federation, and really it was distilling to this issue, uh, and that is, what is the meaning of the treaties in a contemporary context? What does that uh, mean today? There's only one treaty commission in Canada doing that work. It's the work in Saskatchewan. It was established as a model for other places, and recently there's been a, a similar model, although it's a different mandate in Manitoba, and the parties are contemplating creating one in Alberta. Our role was to build a consensus or a common understanding between the treaty parties. This is the first time, the first time that the treaty parties have ever sat down and discussed what they entered into in a meaningful way, if you can believe that. In many ways, many ways that fact alone explains why there's such a gap in the understanding between the First Nations and Canada with respect to the meaning of the treaties. Now in 1998, the OTC completed the first phase of its discussions at the table and this was captured in a document called the Statement of Treaty Issues, Treaties as a Bridge to the Future. I'm very happy with this document because it chronicles the work that was done in the 14 common principles that Canada and FSIN agreed to as being the underlying principles in the treaty relationship. It's very foundational to the future uh, because those principles have been agreed to. You know, when I first started my work, I said to Canada and to FSIN, park your positions. Your positions are a million miles apart. What I want you to focus on is where do you want to be 50 years from now? Think of your interests, 40, 30, 20, 10. How do you get there? And when the parties thought about their common interests, they were able to come up with that document. Now, the parties in, have made a very historic first step in engaging in this meaningful dialogue on their common understandings and a common vision for the future. Well, how did they do that? They went back to the source of their relationship, and that in, is Treaty Number 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10 in Saskatchewan. And they discussed the treaties from all perspectives, including the spiritual, the legal, and the political foundations of treaty. And here in Saskatchewan, Treaty Number 4 at Fort Capel in southern Saskatchewan, in this territory, is Treaty Number 6, uh, signed at uh, Fort Carleton and Fort Pitt in 1876. Well, what are treaties? When I tell people that there is hope and it's based on the treaties, they say to me, well, what do these treaties, what do these treaties mean that were signed in the 19th century with respect to the 21st century? And the short answer is they have a lot to do with the future of Saskatchewan. I quickly found out when I was appointed that the treaties have a very crucial but yet misunderstood role here in Saskatchewan. A treaty is an agreement between two groups of people to do things for each other in a respectful way for mutual benefit, for mutual benefit. Another way of thinking about the treaties is that they are essentially contracts. They're contracts and contracts of course have to be honoured. In fact, the treaties in Saskatchewan outline what the Government of Canada agreed to do with the First Nations people in exchange for access to the land that eventually became the province of Saskatchewan. What many people don't understand is those, those treaties benefit everyone here today. You know, when my ancestors came into Saskatchewan, they, they settled in the Treaty 4 territory. They were exercising a treaty right. Their right to come onto this territory came directly from Treaty Number 4. They didn't know it, I'm sure of that, nobody told them that, but that in fact is accurate. So my right to be on this territory comes from my antecedents who are exercising a treaty right to be here. Everyone in this room is a treaty person. It takes two sides to make a treaty, two sides to maintain a treaty. 
we're all treaty people. Treaties are a two-way street. Well, why were treaties made? Well, in 1763, King George III granted a royal proclamation which established the guidelines for peaceful expansion of the territory known as British North America. That royal proclamation is very, very important. Why? It's a Magna Carta for Aboriginal people and Aboriginal rights. It recognizes and protects First Nations lands. It recognizes the ownership of those lands in the hands of First Nations. And it recognized Aboriginal people as nations. It set out the manner in which the British could acquire these lands. It had to be done by treaty. It had to be done by the Crown. It couldn't be done by the Virginia Company, the Hudson's Bay Company. It had to be done by the Crown. And it set out the legal framework for treaty making as derived from the King. Now, it was that precedent, that precedent that was uh, followed here in Western Canada between 1874 and 1906 when the five treaties affecting what is now Saskatchewan were concluded between the Cree, the Soto, or the Plains Ojibwe, the Assiniboine people, or, or the Nakota people, the Dene nations, and the new Dominion of Canada acting on behalf of the British Crown. Now, at that time, two streams of tradition came together. The British, of course, had a long tradition of alliance making and treaty building and um, economic uh, affiliations for peaceful relations with other nations. Now, so did the First Nations. The First Nations were making treaty on this territory long before the British Crown showed up amongst the other First Nations. Now, the treaties were intended to capture an ongoing relationship, a relationship that was to last as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the river flows. I'm sure you've heard of those words. Those words are very, very consistent with the First Nations worldview. They were spoken by the first treaty commissioner, Alexander Morris, in 1874 at Fort Quipel. Now, his statement was designed to convey the idea to the First Nations that this wasn't a quick land sale transaction. They were entering into a relationship, a bridge to the future, politically, economically, and socially. That's what he was conveying. He chose those words very much on purpose, and they were to convey that thought, that idea of partnership, that idea of mutual benefit. That's what he told the First Nations. Why did Canada enter into these treaties? Well, in 1870, Canada was a very young country. It had just purchased Rupert's land for 300,000 British pounds from the Hudson's Bay Company. Canada was motivated for three principal reasons. Number one, they wanted to have peaceful settlement. They wanted to bring settlers from the east to the west, and they wanted to do it in a way that uh, facilitated harmony and good relations. This was, in fact, the centerpiece of Sir John A. Macdonald's national policy. You know, we all learned about the national policy in schools in Saskatchewan. We never learned, I'm sure, about the role treaties played in that national policy. Treaties were a condition precedent. They had to have a treaty before they could come onto the territory. So in a sense, uh, the treaties are a cornerstone in McDonald's national policy. Second reason, Canada was very cognizant of the American experience. And Professor Jim Miller, who's here today, has shared this with me many times. And he pointed out to me that the United States almost went bankrupt after the Civil War in the 1870s. They were spending $25 million a year to conduct the Indian Wars in the United States. And of course, it was a confrontational and a lot of loss of, of life and uh, very destructive. At the same time, the government of Canada's whole budget in that same 10-year period was roughly $20 million. So Canada knew that they didn't want to, to go down that path. They wanted to have a diplomatic approach. And um, just as an example, in 1874, when the Northwest Mounted Police came to this territory, there was about 400 uh, officers. At the same time, the Blackfoot Confederacy could muster 7,000 warriors. So they were, you know, totally outnumbered. And there was a way to do this in a much better, more diplomatic fashion than the costly approach the Americans had taken. Thirdly, Canada needed to affirm its sovereignty on this territory. There was a lot of pressure in the United States to move the border north of the 49th parallel to, in fact, annex Rupert's Land. If you look at the uh, Republican Party's policy platform in 1864, they talked about that. They were setting the stage for that kind of annexation. Canada, Sir John A. Macdonald and the new government in Canada, very concerned about that American expansionist policy or those thoughts. Well, why did the First Nations enter into treaties? As I said, they had their own societies, their own distinct and complex 
cultural, political, economic, and tr social traditions, and treaty making was a centerpiece in the First Nations world. First Nations were motivated principally by three reasons at this time. They were facing a, a drastic economic transition in a changing environment. The ways and means of livelihood were disappearing. The buffalo were almost extinct. In fact, the buffalo used to roam in this territory right through here, right to the North Saskatchewan River and beyond. But by 1879, they were almost gone. In fact, the last buffalo crossed the 49th parallel north in 1879 at the Cypress Hills, never to be seen again, more or less. Secondly, the First Nations knew that for any chance for uh, 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 themselves to participate in the new economy, the new economy that uh, was coming, they had to learn the ways of the newcomers, such as farming skills and education. And if you look at the written text of the treaties, those are key components in that text. That's what they were bargaining for. That's what they tried to get in 1874 and 1876, <coughs> Treaty 4 and Treaty 6. They didn't get that for a variety of reasons, but that's what they were trying for. Thirdly, the First Nations knew that for any chance for a prosperous future, they had to protect their own interests and their own way of life, and the way to do that was through the treaty process. What was the post-treaty making experience? Well, after the treaties were negotiated, European settlers immigrated and settled into the territory that eventually became Saskatchewan. And as they did so, they began to form communities and, to bega and began enjoying rights that they couldn't always maintain in the countries from which they had come, for instance, land ownership. This was a chance for the newcomers to own land in fee simple, and they knew that, and that's one of the big motivators for them to come here. And of course, they wanted to have a brighter future for their, their children. Secondly, freedom of religion. You know, many people that came into Saskatchewan were in fact persecuted in Europe, but here they were able to practice their own religion freely, and they embraced that, and they came in large numbers. Now here's the central problem. The treaty relationship never found its rightful place in the Canadian state, but rather the good intentions of the original treaty parties were replaced by the paternalistic policies inherent in the Indian Act regime. That is a policy regime, an assimilation policy, that failed the First Nations and in fact it failed all Canadians. An example, Duncan Campbell Scott was in effect the Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs in 1929 in Ottawa, and he told parliamentarians, don't worry, in 50 years we won't have an Indian problem in Canada. Why? Because we won't have any Indians. How are we going to do that? We're going to institute the assimilation policy and make it work. So that's an example of the thinking in 1929. It's, a, it's rather shocking when you hear that, but that's, uh, those are quotes from, uh, from Parliament. You know, as you're aware, Canada is measured every year against a set of social indices from the, by the United Nations. Canada usually comes out number one more or less. It came out a little lower, I think it was seven last year. If you take those same set of social indices and measure the 638 First Nations in Canada against that set of indices, they come out 63rd, just ahead of Macedonia and Armenia. In other words, the, third, the First Nations people in this country are mired in third world poverty. And by any objective standard, that's Canada's national shame. And I ask this question, where is the honour of the Crown? Now ironically, the Indian Act worked to take away rights from the First Nations people, which the newcomers themselves were embracing, and I'll give some examples. There were a number of grievances that occurred after the treaties were concluded, and some of them are as follows. And I always say most Canadians would be shocked, appalled, and ashamed if they knew what their government did to the First Nations people, but for the most part, they simply don't know. Here are some examples. One, the prohibition against spiritual practices. Here we see the well-revered Cree chief Thunderchild, who was imprisoned for attempting to practice his own religion under the assimilation policy. The introduction of the residential schools and the abuse inherent in that system, and I know you're well aware of that, it's in the news often. Here's one you might not be aware of, the permit system. Indians were forced to obtain consent to buy, sell, or lease any property, whether it was livestock, implements, or other things, by Indian agents and by farm instructors, and often the profits were kept uh, by those Indian agents, and this is well chronicled in the book by Sarah Carter, Lost Harvests. A graduate of this university. 
It's an appalling set of facts. Many people don't know it. The pass system. First Nations couldn't leave the reserve without a pass from the Indian agent. Couldn't leave the reserve. Had to get a pass to go anywhere. And we've seen lots of them. Pass uh, from Poundmaker to go to the town of Kutnay. The FSIN, in fact, was established many, many ways because of the good work of Senator John Tatusis, who used to surreptitiously go from reserve to reserve to try to organize the First Nations people politically. Every once in a while, he'd be caught by the RCMP, arrested, sent back to Poundmaker. What really used to get him mad was they used to charge him for the, the railway ticket and come out of his treaty money. So, but he was very tenacious. He was a wise political leader. In 1946, he was instrumental in establishing the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, which today, by any standard, is the strongest regional political organization in Canada. The right to legal counsel, couldn't get a lawyer until 1951, couldn't vote until 1960. The last Indian agent left the reserves in Saskatchewan in 1974. It's not that long ago. Now, it's important to understand the grievances of the past. Why? Because in so many ways, they explain the current reality. They must be understood in order for us to bridge to the future. And they teach us lessons, lessons we all need to know before we can move forward. For instance, if you marginalize people the way the Indian Act has done, there are significant and substantial social consequences to pay. Still to this day, the Indian Act controls the lives of Indians from birth until death in this modern country of Canada. Now, through the Office of the Treaty Commissioner and the work done by Canada and FSN, together those two parties are charting a new course. They're focusing on the future. They're not looking backwards, laying blame, uh, you know, laying down guilt. That's not a constructive way. They're moving forward. They're looking to the for future. And they're looking at that same vision that these treaty elders have talked about at the treaty table. That's what they're looking for. We must acknowledge the mistakes of the past. You have to reaffirm a commitment to the historical treaties, and you have to build a practical, forward-looking relationship. This was recognized by the Government of Canada in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples report, the response by the government. One of the commissioners is here, Paul Chartrand. Canada said, number one, the treaties between the Crown and the First Nations are the basic building blocks in the creation of this country, and it's absolutely true. And that any vision for the future has to build on a recognition of the rights of the Aboriginal people and on the treaty relationship. I'll just digress for a second here and speak about a good example of the treaty relationship in action in Saskatchewan. About a year ago, on March the 29th, 2006, there was a very significant event at the legislature in uh, Regina. Elder Jacob Bill was one of the center elders, as well as some of the elders here, Danny Muskwa, Simon Kaitwahat, and the female elders that are with us, Alma Kaitwahat, Gladys Wapas and others that were here, Amelia, that were here to see the, for the first time the treaties being honored, the treaty relationship being recognized in the legislative building in Saskatchewan. It was the exact 100th anniversary of the legislature in Saskatchewan. They were honoring the First Nations contribution in Saskatchewan. The first time a pipe ceremony had ever been held in that building. All members of the house were present, both sides of the house, as well as a number of school children. It was very, very important. And our elder, Alma Kaitwahad, made this point. She makes it often. Every square meter of the province of Saskatchewan is covered by the sacred blanket created by the treaties. Every square meter. That event set a very positive foundation for hope for the next hundred years in the treaty relationship. Hope that it'll be a much more positive relationship, a harmonious relationship, a much more beneficial relationship to all people in Saskatchewan in the next hundred years. So how do we turn a page on the past? Well, that is happening because in 1982, Canada's constitution was repatriated. And in section 35 of that constitution, our constitution, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights were recognized and affirmed. And some of the salient points are these. Number one, the Supreme Court of Canada says the treaties can't be ignored anymore. They've been saying that since 1973. I'll talk about that in a second. We all live under the rule of law. The treaties are part of the Constitution. It's the supreme law of the land. The, the Constitution has to be honored. The treaties have to be recognized and honored. Now, as I mentioned before, when I went to high school in Saskatchewan, we never talked about the treaties. 
We learned about the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Utrecht, the treaties that ended wars in Europe. We didn't talk about the basic building blocks of our country. It wasn't on the radar screen. In fact, when I was in the, this law school in 1973, you know, the Calder case, we barely talked about the First Nations issues and Aboriginal title. So things are changing. Things are changing. In 1999, we did a study at the OTC. We said this. We said, <clears throat> what do you know about the treaties? And we asked that question to non-Aboriginal people in Saskatchewan. 78% of the people said they knew very little about treaties. 68% of those same people said they felt that if they knew more about the treaties and the treaty relationship, the relationship between themselves and other First, and First Nations people would improve. My own view is this, that it's more like 99.9% .9 of people really don't understand the treaties. Uh, and that's explainable because they never took it in school. But I also noticed it doesn't stop 100% of the people from having an opinion whether they know anything or not. Now, how do we turn a page in the past? Well, at the treaty table, we've been working on these discussions, and there's four basic principles that guided those discussions. Number one, treaties aren't confined to the written text. Treaties aren't confined in the written text. And the courts have said, if you want to understand the spirit and intent of treaty, if you want to fully understand the treaties, you have to understand the oral side, the oral history of treaties, the First Nations history of treaties. And there's a very, very strong protocol that guides the, the, the way that uh, history can be transmitted. Very strong protocol. It's called top way when you have to, the only thing that the treaty elders can tell us is what they heard, who they heard it from, and they can't add, diminish, uh, or expand what they heard. It's very, very succinct, and it's very, very, in my opinion, accurate. Well, in Saskatchewan, we commissioned some work done by uh, Harold Cardinal, the late Harold Cardinal, and Walter Hildebrand, a graduate of this university, too, to answer the question, what was the motivation, expectation, and intention of the First Nations when they entered into treaty? And some of the elders that are here, these, are, these elders, I'm so honored that they're here today, are the philosophy elders, the communication elders, the education elders, and I invite you to have a chat with them after this presentation. I'm honored that they, they're, they're here. They have so much knowledge to share, and they deserve so much reverence from, from all of us for their good work. Their thoughts and ideas are captured in this book. It's available everywhere. It's published by the University of uh, Calgary. Second major component of the research we did initially was conducted by Jim Miller of this university who's here today. He uh, wrote the book Bounty and Benevolence with his colleagues Frank Tuff and Arthur Ray. Those historians answered the same question for the first time ever. The history of the Saskatchewan treaties was captured in this book, Bounty and Benevolence, published by McGill Queens. It's absolutely cutting edge. And if you look at the Treaty Elders book and you look at what Jim Miller found and what he's chronicled, in this book, you'll see that there's an amazing congruence between the two books about the nature of the treaty relationship, what was intended, what was sought, what was motivating both sides as they entered into that treaty. A couple of other uh, principles uh, that guided the discussions, and, uh, and I'll go quickly here. The right of self-governance, it's an aboriginal right, it's an absolute right. Uh, build a forward-looking relationship, that's what the parties wanted to do, and they wanted to do this under the rubric of the honour of the Crown a very, very important idea. And what does the honour of the Crown mean? Well, I'll capture it this way. It means our capacity as Canadians operating in a mature society to act from principle from the highest moral standard. The honour of the Crown really sets this. What is the honour of Canada? How is Canada seen in international eyes with respect to the relationship we've created under treaty with the First Nations? It's not a very good picture. That has to change, and that's what's happening in Saskatchewan, I hope. Well, what do the treaties mean to First Nations people? This was very critical in the, in the uh, book that, uh, that we wrote, and it's available for you later. First Nations view treaties as sacred agreements. They hold both the treaties and the crown in great reverence. At our treaty table in Saskatchewan, you heard representatives of the FSIN and several elders speak about treaties and the Crown in very, very consistent terms. Treaties created a lasting relationship with the Crown and her subjects and with the Creator as a witness to that agreement. Treaties are a covenant. They're like an Old Testament covenant. They're of that order, that high, the highest moral order. 
The late Norman Sunchild, a Treaty 6 Cree elder from Thunderchild First Nations, said this, when Treaty 6 First Nations finally agreed to the treaty, the treaty commissioner took the promises and he raised them in his hand and raised them to the sky, placing the treaties in the hands of the Great Spirit. Time to come. The late Nakoda elder, the late George Ryder, of Carry the Kettle First Nations, said this, the pipe is holy. It's a way of life for Indian people. The treaty ha was made with the pipe, and that is sacred. That is never to be broken, never to be put away. Soto elder Danny Musqua, who's here today, said this. He's from Kisakus First Nation Treaty 4. We made a covenant with Her Majesty's government. And a covenant is not just a relationship between people. It's a relationship between three parties, the Crown, the First Nations, and the Creator. Elder Alma Kaitwa had our resident elder at the OTC said this, it was the queen who offered to be our mother and us to be her children and to love us in a way we want to live. That's the quality of the sentiments expressed by the elders in Saskatchewan from all the five treaty areas in the four linguistic groups. So we have a challenge in Saskatchewan. The challenge is this, demography determines destiny. If you want to see a picture of Saskatchewan in the future, look at the demographics of today and what do they tell you? Half of all the Aboriginal people in Canada between the age of 15 and 24 live in the three prairie provinces. We face a tremendous challenge in this province to create conditions where all people can enjoy a high quality of life. The College of Commerce did a demographic study a few years ago and it shows that 22% of the population in Saskatchewan will be Aboriginal in eight short years, 2015. Statistics also tell us that 46% of the children entering kindergarten will be Aboriginal in that same time period, 2015. In fact, in the city of Prince Albert, it's over that number right now, and that's the way it's going to go in places like North Battleford uh, and uh, some of the surrounding urban centres in Saskatchewan. The median age of First Nations people right now in Saskatchewan is about 18 years of age. The median age for non-Aboriginal people is about 38 years of age. In other words, we have an overwhelming demographic shift happening in this province. And you don't have to look very far, whether it's in the justice system, the health care system, the education system, employment statistics for First Nations people, to see that the status quo is not acceptable. In fact, the status quo is wholly unsustainable. You cannot block 22% of your population from having the skills, the tools to enter into the economy. It's not on, it can't be done. If you keep developing or keep this under, uh, underlying social class poor, impoverished, and not with the ability to, to participate in the economy as full citizens in Canada, you're gonna pay a terrible, terrible price. We're on the road to social chaos if we don't deal with this, and we're not dealing with it in an effective way today in Saskatchewan or Canada. Now in Canada we've seen three primary ways in which First Nations issues have been approached. Confrontation, litigation, or cooperation. Now the outcomes of confrontation, whether it's the standoff in Oka, the violence in Iverwash, the blockades in British Columbia, the lobster dispute in New Brunswick, the Caledonia dispute, shows there are no winners in confrontation. Apparently there's more of this to come on June 29th this year. You know, when people don't have a place to go, when they don't have a proper place, a process that they have confidence in to deal with, these issues will just be exacerbated. And I think the need for a proper process in this country is clarion. Look at litigation. You know, you can be embattled in courtroom litigation for years and years and have disputes that little that result in little satisfaction for either dispute, and that's more than obvious. So we need to come together, we need to promote cooperation, and we need to recognize our collective common interests to do that. We need to educate ourselves for the benefit not only of ourselves, but our children and grandchildren. Now with respect to treaty implementation, this report that I've been talking about, in July 2005, Canada and FSIN commissioned our office to write an independent report and answer this question, how do we implement the treaties in a modern context. How do we do that? They asked the Treaty Commission to give an independent answer. So by definition, in my opinion, Canada is admitting that they haven't implemented the treaties properly just, to, just for someone to answer that question for them. On February the 15th, about a month ago, we answered that uh, a question in the report called Treaty Implementation Fulfilling the Covenant. 
what does this report say? How is it, it's, was it created? 